here we go. So just like to thank a few folks right off the bat here who helped with some aspects of the presentation today, uh, Patrick, Liz, and Todd, and of course the Salamander team, that's Deanne, Sarah, and Matt. They are all out this week on a training, so they get to miss the presentation <laughs> live at least. By the end here, you're gonna have some idea of how the Endangered Species Act impacts the city's operations, watershed's operations, how the salamander conservation team, that's the team I work with, fulfills some of our obligations under the Endangered Species Act, and also what endangered species are likely to impact future city operations and, and kind of what that might look like. So to begin, let's talk about what an endangered species is. So there's different ways we can use that word endangered species. So, you know, on the sort of biology scientific side of thing, we might refer to an endangered species, a species that based on the information we have looks like it has a higher than normal probability of going extinct or a highly likely probability of it going extinct. Okay, we can use it in that way for this talk. And when we're talking about regulations, and endangered species or threatened species is really a legal definition, okay? And that's how we'll be talking about them today. There are 10 species in Travis County uh, in our Austin area that are listed as either threatened or endangered. And the Endangered Species Act says that it's unlawful to harm any of these species, okay? So you cannot kill them, harm, can also mean harass them, so affect their behavior in, in a negative way, for example. All of those things can be illegal. Now, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the federal agency responsible for administering the Endangered Species Act for, for our terrestrial and, and uh, freshwater aquatic species. They have a process described by the Endangered Species Act that describes how they're going to list or delist a, a species. So how they put a species on this list. And we're not going to go into their administrative process, but in general, we kind of want to understand like how does a species get to becoming endangered? And oftentimes it's due to habitat loss or degradation. Okay. It could be exploitation or disease. But certainly in our county, that's very highly developed. Habitat loss and degradation is, is one of the big drivers for uh, a species ending up on the list. Additionally, and this is the case for many of the species on this slide, they may have a very small range, meaning they occur in a few places in the world. So, for example, some of these karst invertebrates may only be known from one or two caves. They, you know, they may occur in other, other caves in the area, but something that lives in a cave is gonna be hard to find. These are often very small and we don't have great access to the places, all of the places these very small critters can, can fit into. Golden Cheek Warbler has a bit larger range. You know, they nest in areas across central Texas, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the ranges on the next slide. But the idea is, you know, if you have a small range and your habitat's degraded, you could be at, at higher risk of extinction. Another way to, to think about it or another reason why something might be endangered, you know, could have a, a large range even, but if they have very few, if there are very few individuals in the wilds, that can also affect it. I, we'll, we'll use our, our good friend Todd here to put it in, a, in another way. Each one of them is rarer than any diamond. Thank you, Todd. So the idea being that the California condor, for example, really huge range, but but extremely endangered because there ended up only being a few left in, in the wild at their, at their lowest point. So getting to the specific ranges within our county, so it's kind of a mis mis mismatch of data here, and we'll go through them one by one. In the legend here, you'll see karst and vertebrates. So they're all kind of lumped together, mainly because they're regulated together. It's hard to know exactly where any of one of them will will pop up except in a cave somewhere. That's what we mean by the, the car. So they're predicted to be, you have a higher probability if you encounter a cave in the stippled area, in these stippled areas here, a higher probability of encounter uh, countering uh, one of the karst invertebrate species that are listed. Jumping up to the golden cheek warbler, that's this, these light green splotches. 
Again, those are areas that are predicted to have high habitat quality for the bird when they're here during their breeding season in the spring and summer. And then for the salamanders, we're a bit more detailed. We actually have all of the known observations plotted out on a map. So in the south here, Barton Springs salamander in red. Of course, they're at Barton Springs. They're overlapping here with the Austin blind salamanders. But they also occur at springs along the Colorado River, along Barton Creek, and uh, several along Onion Creek. The Jollyville Plateau salamander living in northwest Austin, they're spread out a bit more, a lot more known localities, mainly because we're seeing them coming out of these springs that are coming out of the Edwards Aquifer, whereas for the Barton Springs and Austin Blind Salamander, we believe that probably most of their populations are underground in the Barton Springs segment of the Edwards Aquifer, especially for the Austin Blind Salamander, who's only been observed at the surface uh, at the Barton Springs. And then there's the Texas bat bucket. And this wasn't on the previous slide because they're not officially listed as threatened or endangered yet. They're proposed for being listed. Again, that's a part of the, the process that the Fish and Wildlife Service has to go through as described by the act to get a species listed. And they're in the southeastern part of the county. And we'll get a little bit more into them sort of at the end of the ship here. Now, I want you to imagine now the city has projects all over. I don't have any specific ones on this slide. I got the ETJ there, all of Travis County, and a lot of the places you can go, maybe not anywhere, but many of the places you can go in the city or in Travis County, you have the potential to be near endangered species habitat. So any city project that can affect that, that can affect their habitat, can directly impact the species, what does that mean? Well, I said earlier, the Endangered Species Act says it's unlawful to harm any of these species and not just kill them, but harm them in any way. And so you can imagine this could create massive problems for pre preventing infrastructure from, from being built, for example. Well, there's, there's a way around that, as you, you might expect. And there's kind of two primary ways this is done through the act, section seven and section 10. And we, we name them by the sections. This is jargony because that's, that tends to be how uh, we, we talk about it when you're talking about um, permitting and how you're going to get approval to lawfully harm a threatened or endangered species. So what section seven is about is about the interagency cooperation. That is cooperation between federal agencies. Now the city's not a federal agency, but we may have a project that has federal funds or a project that requires a different type of federal permitting. And I'll give an example on the next slide. And so that's where section seven would come in. The other one is section 10. So this is directly for issuing permits for otherwise prohibited activities. So you have a project that is gonna affect, affect an endangered species, you will need to likely go through section 10 if it doesn't involve a federal agency. So the section seven example is our old land passes dam modernization. This is a watershed protection department project meant to rehab this failing stormwater dam infrastructure. To do a project like this in a creek, often a permit from the Corps of Engineers, Clean Water 404 permit is required. Just think of normal process. Okay, we need to go to the Corps of Engineers. That's a federal agency. Can we have this permit to do this work in the creek? Okay, you have to meet the regulation, their guidelines under the Clean Water Act. Okay, but now there's a catch. Because you have some pesky biologists go out there and they find a bunch of salamanders in your project area. Oh boy, now what? Well, this is where Section 7 kicks in. This says that now the Corps of Engineers needs to converse with the Fish and Wildlife Service before they issue their permit to us. This is called a Section 7 consultation. Now, watershed protection, of course, is involved in this process. The way it usually goes down is that you end up having a three-way conversation between the applicant, that's the Watershed Protection Department in this case, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Corps of Engineers to figure out how to minimize and mitigate impacts to the species while the Corps of Engineers issues our permit and we do the work we need to do to protect lives, property, and the environment. And so at the end of this process, the service may issue what's called a biological opinion. Effectively, that's your permit. I don't think they call it a permit, but they issue that opinion to the core that says, you know, if you're doing it in this, this, and this way, then 
you should comply with the act. Now, we were just issued this permit in 2022. This just came out this year, brand new. So there's some music I listen to. Great. All right. In 1993, we were listening to some different songs. I was just a boy, 13 years old. What's going on at Barton Springs Pool? Well, early in the year, business as usual, okay? Crowded, swimmers. And then when there's not swimmers, it's closed. They're drawing the pool down very frequently, once a week, I think it was. They're adding chemicals to the pool, okay? Chlorine, for example, caused some fish kills. That was a problem, all right? But chlorine otherwise, I don't, I don't think that was illegal. Might have been. In any case, they were doing it. Not great for the things that live there. Killed some algae. Then later on in 1993, some biologists described a salamander that lived there. Now, pe we, people knew that there was a salamander living here. The difference is they use molecular techniques to say, actually, this species at this pool is unique. It's very different from all the other ones we see in Texas. Eurycea sasorum, it was named uh, after the SOS uh, movement which we won't get into. But in any case, a few years down the road, the Barton Springs salamander was listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act, which meant it was illegal for the city to be doing these activities, putting in chemicals, drawing the water down, exposing their habitat, because those things killed salamanders and harmed salamanders, right? So the city had to get a permit. And because there's no federal agency involved here, the city applied for a Section 10 permit for Barton Springs Pool, which I will talk a little bit. But before I do so, just a little overview of the Section 10 permits here. There's a lot involved in a incidental take permit. That's our 10A1B permit is, is what it's called. This requires a big, long document to be written called an HCP, Habitat Conservation Plan. It describes how you're harming the animal, how you're going to minimize and mitigate harm to the animal or plant, uh, you know, in this case, the salamander, research and monitoring. Okay, there's a lot of things that go into this. Typically, you get a permit for decades, not a couple of years, okay, because it takes a lot to get one of these permits. It can take two to even 10 years just to obtain a 10A1B permit, depending on your project. Now, there's another type of permit, 10A1A, same section, okay. This is more about doing science on species or certain recovery efforts. So this allows to, for you to purposely harm the species, okay? But uh, the, the goal is for ultimate, um, ultimately to help them, okay? So they, these, these permits are easier to get. And of course, the city has both of these uh, types of permits. I mentioned the salamanders a little bit. Let's go back to the karst and invertebrates and the birds. The city holds a Section 10 permit for all of those species indicated under the Balcones Canyonlands Conservation Plan. That's an HCP. And this is a multi-agency plan that, you know, it involves both the city, Travis County, and some other folks, and it covers development activity largely. So developers, if they're going to develop land where they're going to harm or potentially harm golden cheek warbler, karst invertebrates, they can pay into a fund that's used to purchase and protect additional habitat for these species within their range. Okay, so that's the trade-off. That was the sort of the main overview of, of that plan. And then there's the Barton Springs Pool Habitat Conservation Plan, the other Section 10 plan that the city has. The, our department basically is the lead. We administer this plan. The director signs this plan. And we first received the permit in 1998, and then it was re renewed in, in 2013. And as I mentioned, that's covering activities at Barton Springs Pool. The Jollyville Plateau Salamander is not covered under any Section 10 permit. So there's no sort of uh, blanket of activities that we have coverage for specifically under Section 10 for that species, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So in terms of what our team does as it relates to the Endangered Species Act, I've hinted on a bunch of these things. We'll split them out here between programmatic duties, which you know the stuff that takes up most of our time, and then the stakeholder issues where the city's somehow a stakeholder in an endangered species issue. So programmatically, our permits for the Barton Springs pool, you know, these are things that cumulatively or collectively amongst all of our staff 
are taking 80 to 90 percent of our time. That's mostly what we're doing is stuff related to these permits. And under the, the 10A1B permit, the incidental take permit, we're allowing for activities that can potentially cause harm to salamanders like recreation, um, pool drawdowns and cleaning. And of course it specifies you know, exactly what's allowed and what's not there. And in return for being allowed to recreate and manage the pool, the city's promised to do a number of things such as protect habitats. Here's uh, Eliza Spring, it's got a fence around it, authorized personnel only, okay? So it's just used for research and, and, and education but otherwise the public are not allowed in there. This is the same for Old Mill Spring. We promise to do surveys, different types of habitat management at the springs. Again, this is part of the sort of give and take because we are allowed to recreate and manage the pool. We also promise to do, to do science and research on the species. There are a few one-off habitat restoration projects projects listed in our permit. This includes, for example, the Eliza Stream Daylighting Project. So the city also needed to repair this drainage infrastructure. This is in salamander habitat. And the outcome here was to build new habitat as a stream for the salamander. I mentioned the Section 7 consultation for the Old Land Passes Dam earlier. So this is another thing we're getting more and more involved in, particularly with the Jollyville Plateau Salamander. There are various projects um, I'll talk about in a bit on that. And the other thing that kind of overlaps the Endangered Species Act, not so much the salamander team, but uh, Aquifer Science and Conservation and our geologists uh, are void investigations. So this is part of our, our land development code, I believe. Uh, but to enter a void, they have the potential to encounter karst invertebrates. They need a scientific permit to do that. And that activity is covered under our 10A, 1A permit. And as I mentioned earlier, there are certain stakeholder activities that we're periodically involved in. This is just kind of stuff here and there. For example, Fish and Wildlife Service listing decisions, species status assessments. They're coming to us. They're asking for data. They're asking for our expertise. And we provide it to them. We're also involved in scientific advisory committees, which also relate to regional planning and coordination related to conservation of the endangered species, as well as some water quality overlap there as well. So getting back to the endangered species in our area and looking at the future, you know, I mentioned the Section 10 permits and a lot of what we do are covered you know, I say we as a city are covered by those permits, but there are two species that are not as much. So the Jollyville Plateau Salamander, there's been a few one-off Section 7 uh, consultations where coverage was obtained for that species. But in general, there's no blanket coverage for the species. So how will we handle that in the future? And what about other departments? So let's focus on this salamander here. Here we are, we're zoomed in Northwest Austin, got an aerial view. I mentioned the old land passes stand modernization, went through that section seven consultation, it was finally, the permitting was finally approved just this year. There's another project that's in the works. This is by the water utility, uh, Bolt Creek Group 7 wastewater line replacement. Okay, what's going on here? Well, there's a creek, a tributary of Bolt Creek, and next to that is a wastewater line. And in that creek, there are threatened salamanders protected by the Endangered Species Act. The water utility wants to replace this line. Okay, it needs to happen. They need to upgrade it. Okay, so currently we're in discussion, the city with the Fish and Wildlife Service, talking about how does the city get take coverage for this project? I don't know how it's going to shake out. Okay, but it's something we're working on. You can imagine there are going to be other projects that come up. You know, the city watershed in particular does a lot of work in creeks, streams, stormwater infrastructure, that type of thing, water quality. And then there are other departments such as the water utility that because of where their infrastructure is, is also affecting these things. So how prepared are we? Now, we have a lot of experience with the salamander. The city's been studying the species since the 90s as a result of a um, something that came down from council, I believe, that said, hey, we need to get on top of this. You guys need to, to study the species and understand what's going on. They knew it was going to eventually be listed and that this would cause you know, some of the types of issues I'm talking about. So we've got some experience doing habitat restoration. 
mishaps here and there, minor stuff, minor stuff we're talking about, okay? But in general, we've been largely successful. Okay, so here's an example with this low water crossing that was removed, uh, took it out, habitat restored itself, salamanders returned. Another habitat restoration project we've done, different salamander, but same concepts really, Eliza Stream, it's been really successful. Here's some data for you. I think it's the only graph in my presentation. Um, no, there's one on the next slide. Here you can see the stream started flowing in 2017, and then within about a year and a half, we really started to see a, a lot more salamanders in the stream. So by 2020, two, two of our surveys, we were seeing more salamanders in the stream than we were in the pool part of, of Eliza, not, not Martin Springs pool, but the Eliza Spring pool, what, what, uh, what had been there for a long time. I call that wildly successful. So we have experience with this habitat restoration. I mentioned the science and the data. We've been studying the species since the late 90s and or mid 90s, rather. I think we're up to 10 peer reviewed publications that either we're the leads on or we contributed data towards. And so the long and short of it is we have a lot of expertise and institutional knowledge for the species. So when it comes to engaging in permitting processes and negotiations and endangered species issues, we're, we're well prepared. So overall, I think we've had a lot of success over the years. So a few high points, two permits have been approved. So this is the big one. It allows Barton Springs Pool to stay open. Okay, in terms of species protection, we've helped protect and conserve Barton Springs salamanders by establishing a captive assurance colony, um, scientific discoveries and contributions, habitat restoration, and our knowledge and expertise here then has facilitated getting successful permitting done so that watershed can do its job, so that the city can do what it needs to do. And of course, there's some future things coming up where we've been involved in some discussions. So the question really for the Jollyville Plateau salamander in this region for city projects is, is not so much how are we going to prepare, but how how is watershed as a department? Because you know we, we have the staff and, and expertise in-house. How are we interfacing with other departments that may have projects in this area? How are they going to know they need to comply with the ESA that we have resources they can use? And how are we going to decide to interface with them, right? Because if it's not within our mission, it's another department's mission, right? And so what's going to be our time and staff commitment for that? That's not a question. You know, that's above my pay grade. The other species I want to talk about with regard to future endangered species issues is the, the mussel. So if we compare the work we've done with the salamanders, we have the data expertise. These are going to help us comply with Endangered Species Act permitting, this is going to save time and money. With the mussels, this is a newer issue. We haven't been working on the mussels since the 90s. And this fat mucket that's that's probably going to be listed in Austin, I think, is kind of the next big thing we really need to be thinking about. Now, our department has done some work on this, but we're really at the forefront of understanding what the future is going to hold for this species in Austin and how we're going to address it. In general, we have questions like, what projects are gonna be affected by this? Are we gonna be proactive or reactive? With the salamanders, we were certainly proactive, I believe. And you know, the Watershed Protection Department is in an interesting position compared to other departments, because just like for the salamander with this muscle, our mission is gonna help them survive. So we have regulations that, re that protect riparian corridors, reduce construction sediment, filter pollutants, reduce flooding. We have a project delivery group that'll step in when, when regulations haven't been sufficient, but other departments are not in that same position. So in the future, they may need our help and support, just like they're asking us with the salamander, to know if their projects are going to impact the mussel or to help them mitigate what those impacts are going to be. So currently, Watershed does not have funding set aside for mussel research. We may want to partner with other organizations to do this or for creek restoration. But really, you know, whatever direction the city decides to go in with this, and I really do think it needs to be 
a conversation that watershed continues to have and, and to think about. One thing is important to remember. Each one of them is rarer than any diamond. Thank you for Thank that. You for that. Thank you. There are lots of hearts and claps coming in from that presentation. And even though I was involved in stuff like the 2013 Habitat Conservation Plan writing, I always learn something new from you and you raise a bunch of great uh, questions for us to dive into more.